This morning, I'd like to to share a very special message. It's a little different than what we usually do. It's entitled, Who is this man? Who is he? Hmm? As we approach Christmas, we might ask, why was there a Christmas story anyway? What does it really mean? And when did it all begin, this story? Let's look to the scriptures for the answer. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Genesis, the third chapter, beginning at verse 14, as you stand with me and honor the word of God. This is when Christmas began. Adam and Eve had been created by God in a perfect environment. They had dominion over everything, but yet they failed. They failed and they ate the fruit from a tree they were forbidden. And now we see God punishing them and us because of their disobedience. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. You realize it's at one point snakes walked When I was in college in biology, a professor brought in a skeleton of a snake and he was trying to prove evolution because there were marks where there would have been some kind of feet. And I said at the end of the class, I said, Professor, I read that in an old book. That's not new. He said, bring it in. And I had a chance to read the first chapter of Genesis to the whole class, 250 people. (laughs) You know, the Bible proves itself and science, if they wanted to, could prove it very easily. And look what he said to Satan. Here, here's the Christmas message. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be for thy husband. For he shall rule over thee. Not one amen in the place. (laughs) And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in the sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Bless his servant as it brings it forth. You'll notice it talks about the seed of the woman. Women don't seek to make seed. Men do. And there's a whole story with that too. This is going to be a very special birth, as we know. See, Adam... God's special creation became a living soul. A man was given dominion over all that God had created, the animals, the birds, and the fish. Everything was under his control. And later, because of Adam's need of a helpmate, God created Eve out of Adam. And together they walked and they talked with God, learning how to be a man or a woman. They didn't have father and mother. They didn't have uncles and aunts. They had no one to teach them because they weren't born children, they were born adults. And in this paradise, where they had a personal, intimate relationship with God, they disobeyed him, tempted by Satan to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we're paying for it ever since, amen? Their disobedience, their sin separated them from God, this perfect relationship. And God punishes them for their sin, as we have read in the text. But God still loved them. Is anybody listening? Even when we sin, God still loves us hmm? and forgives us. And it talks in this prophetic statement how one day someone would come and bruise the head of Satan. And he in turn would have his heel bruised. And for centuries, the sins of men and women were covered by the sacrificial blood of animals, supervised by the temple priests. And throughout the Old Testament, we read 
where prophets foretold of the coming of a Messiah, this one that would come, a redeemer who would cleanse away, not just cover, but wash away their sins by the shedding of his own blood. In the Old Testament alone, there are 127 prophetic statements concerning the coming Messiah, who he was and what would happen, and all these things that we're about to read about. For over 1,500 years, the prophets prophesied of the Messiah. Our Jewish brothers are still waiting for him. Hmm? And as the last book of the Old Testament was written, by the prophet Malachi, for 400 years from the time that book was written until the new covenant came in, there was silence from God. No prophetic statements, nothing. And then God begins to speak all of a sudden to individuals again because it was time, God's time, to make that prophecy come true. An angel comes and speaks to a priest named Zach Zacharias, an old man with an old wife. They had no children. They were barren. That they would have a son named John, who would be the forerunner of this Messiah, the forerunner of Christ. A miraculous birth, since he and his wife were unable to have children. Another angel, Gabriel, came to speak to a young girl named Mary, a virgin betrothed to Joseph about a miracle birth. Finally, an angel in a dream speaks to Joseph concerning this special birth and his wife Mary, that he was to marry her. It was not a sinful act that she had committed, but it was an act of God. Hallelujah. In Acts, the fifth chapter, we read where Gamaliel, one of the chief priests and teachers in the temple, was speaking to the other priests about what was happening with these Christians, right? These followers of the way. And he brings to them a point that many had come in the past saying they were the Messiah, Yeshua. Many had come and said they were. But when they died, they didn't come back. And their followers disappeared. Recently, in our own time, if you remember, in the Hasidic group, a Rebbe had died a few years back, remember? And people believed that he was the coming Messiah. In fact, when he died, they put a telephone in his, in his casket so he could call when he was awake. <laughs> we haven't gotten any calls from him. But this morning, I'd like to turn this church into a courtroom. Ever been in a courtroom? Hopefully just as a spectator. Because we want to question an individual who has claimed to be the Messiah, Emmanuel, God in the flesh. Who is this man? Who is he? Sir, would you sit down? I'd like to ask you some questions because the jury wants to know who you are. Hmm? Were you the offspring of a woman? Did you have a mother? Because in Genesis 3, we just read that from the seed of a woman would come the Savior. Hmm? And of course, in the story in Luke, we know that not only was a woman bringing forth this child, but it would be her firstborn child. Is that true? Oh, yes, it is. Okay. Were you born from the tribe of Judah? Because prophecy tells us in Genesis 49 that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah, one of the 12 tribes. You are from the tribe of Judah. Both Joseph and Mary were from the tribe of Judah. Hmm? Your name is Jesus of Nazareth, right? Were you born there? Were you born there? Were you born in Nazareth? No. Where were you born? In Bethlehem. Wow. A little tiny little town we visited in Israel a number of years ago. In the book of Micah, it says 
Thou Bethlehem, though you be little, yet you shall come forth. The ruler of Israel shall come forth from thee, whose goings are from everlasting to everlasting. What a coincidence that you should be born there. Hmm. Were you born a king of the line of David? The prophets you say the same thing. The prophet Isaiah tells us he was before he would be reign on David's throne. Are you from the line of David? Oh, you are. Were you born of a virgin? That doesn't make any sense, right? A woman that knew no man has a baby. People have tried it since, it doesn't work. Isaiah tells us that the woman shall be with child, the virgin shall be with child. And of course, as we read the Christmas story in Matthew and in Luke, we see that's exactly what happened. By the way, when you were born, did kings and rulers bring you gifts as a child? Hmm? Did they come from far away? Well, Psalm 72, 10 tells, tells us the kings of Seba and Shera from the east will bring presents and gifts to the Messiah. And we know the story of the kings in Matthew 2. Were children massacred after you were born because King Herod did not want anyone to claim his throne? So he had everyone under the age of two killed. Well, Jeremiah, the prophet in Jeremiah 31, 15, prophesied that this would happen. And of course, we know the story how King Herod had ordered all the children killed. Here's an interesting question for you. Do you have eternal existence? Hmm? Well, in the book of Micah 5, 2, it says that you are eternal. And we read in John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Hallelujah. Were you ever taken to another country as a child? Oh, you were. Where was it? Into Egypt. Because Herod was killing all the children. An angel came to Joseph and said, remove yourself, your wife and the child, and go to Egypt until I tell you to come back. That was prophesied by Hosea in Hosea 11.1. 1. Listen to this question. Were you rejected by your brethren, by your brothers? A lot of churches teach that Jesus didn't have any brothers, that Mary always was a virgin. If you read the, the prophetic statement to Mary, it says this to Joseph. You will not touch her until after she has this baby. Now, what does that mean? All right. Well, he, he, he obeyed, and look, look at the blessing that came. We read in the, in the New Testament, in Mark 6 and 5, in two places where it names four half-brothers of Jesus, James, Joseph, Jude, and Simon, and it says, and his sisters. Hmm, they were pretty busy in those days. Those were your half-brothers and sisters. Yes, they were. Again, Psalm 69 and 8 tells us they rejected him. But thank God we know for a fact that two of them, James and Jude, accept Christ after his crucifixion. They write two of the books of the New Testament that you can read. Well, the rulers of Israel, they, 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 did he take counsel against you? They came against you, the priests and the leaders? Because Psalm 2 and 12 says that's what's going to happen. They did. And we read in Matthew 12 and 14, the Pharisees went out and plotted to kill you. Is that true? Yes. In Matthew 26 and 3, we read the chief priests and the elders plotted to arrest you and kill you. Is that what happened? Oh, okay. Did you ever enter the temple and cause a commotion? 
Well, Jesus did this twice, by the way. Malachi 3.1 tells us prophetically he would enter the temple and cause a ruckus. And we read twice where he comes into the temple and in the lobby of the temple they were selling sacrificial animals that were supposed to be perfect. They painted them up. They made them look like they were perfect. And they shortchanged the people because temple, the temple didn't accept your money from whatever country you came from. You had to change it for temple money. Like at the airport, right? When you go to a country, and guess who got messed up in the trade? You and I, right? Again, we read in Matthew 21, where Jesus empties the temple, and one of my favorite stories, drives all these thieves out. You've made my father's house a den of thieves, right? People think Jesus walked around very religious. This is one of those parts where he kicks out, boom, get out, and a little whipping too, right? And nobody comes back at him. He was no wimp like some pictures of him, right? He looked pretty good there. Did you go to people that were not your people? See, the Jews were very prejudiced. They only hung out with their own people. They had nothing to do with the Samaritans or the Romans or any other foreign group. But remember, Jewish is not a nationality. It's a religion. Right? It's not a color, it's a religion. In Isaiah 55, 4 and 5, it says, Surely you will summon nations you know not. You'll have something to do with people that are not yours, at least as a Jew. In Romans 9, we read this. It says, Even us, whom he also called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. How many Gentiles are here this morning? Most of us, right? Hallelujah. Did you come into Jerusalem one day riding on a donkey? You did? Well, the prophet Zechariah, in Zechariah 9.9, prophesied that one day the Messiah will come in riding on a donkey. See your king, it says, comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. That was a week before they crucified him. The same people that said Hosanna were at the cross, crucifying him, right? And that is recorded in every one of the New Testament books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the story of Jesus. It is said that you would be a stumbling stone to the Jews. Isaiah 8.14. What does that mean? It says, he will be a sanctuary, but for both houses of Israel, he will be a stone that causes men to stumble. In Romans 9 and 31, Paul explains it when he said, Israel stumbled over the stumbling stone because they can't get past him. Hmm? They can't explain him. Even today in synagogues, all these scriptures are not read. Why? especially Isaiah 53, because it is a perfect description of what happens in the life of Jesus and in the death and resurrection. In 1 Peter 2 and 7, he tells us they stumble because they disobey the message. When you came, as you say, did the deaf hear and the blind see? Well, Isaiah, in Isaiah 29 and 18 and Isaiah 35, 5, tells us that when Jesus would come, the Messiah would come, he would heal the deaf and the blind. In fact, in Matthew 11, it says the blind receive sight, the lame walk, leprosy is cured, and the deaf hear. Is that true? Yes, he said. And there are many witnesses to this all throughout the Bible. Did you fulfill the promises to the Jews and be a light to the Gentiles? Did you? Well, the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 4 and 6, 42 and 6, and Isaiah 49 and 6, that that's exactly what you came for. In Luke 2 and 25, we read a revelation to the Gentiles 
and glory to the people of Israel, a light to his own people and to the Gentiles in Acts 26, 25. When you came, as you say, you came, did you bring a new covenant, a new testament in your life? In Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 34, it tells us that he would bring a new agreement between people and God, one of grace. Hmm? When we do the communion, this cup is a new covenant a new testament in my blood shed for many for the remission of our sins. My goodness. Were you a prophet like Moses speaking the word of God? Deuteronomy 18 and 15 says he came to speak as a prophet. In Matthew 21 and 11 and Luke 7 and 16 and John 6 and 14 we see he is prophetic in the things that he says to the people that he deals with. Were you hated without reason? Hmm? People hated you. You didn't do anything to them, but they hated you. Because the Psalms 35 and 19 says he would be hated. Imagine you're waiting for a Savior and a Redeemer, and you get hate. Right? In John 15, Jesus speaks and says, they hated both me and my father without cause. Did you come to do the will of God or your own will? Hmm? Well, Isaiah 47 and 8 said he, he would come to do the father's will. And in Matthew 26 and 39, you will see where he says, not my will, but thy will be done. Were you anointed by God? Were you set apart by God? In Psalms 45 and 6 and 7, it says that, the, that the Messiah would be anointed by God. In Hebrews 1 and 8, we see, therefore God has anointed thee with the oil of gladness. Are we glad that Jesus came? Amen. Was there a mission to sent to prepare the way for you? Again, Malachi 3.1 that someone would come and be the forerunner, telling people that there's one coming greater than I. Repent, prepare the way. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. His name was John the Baptist. Was he, wasn't he your cousin? He was, okay. Were you the Passover sacrifice for mankind? In the book of Numbers, we read where God established the Passover. And how they came out of Egypt and so on. But we read in Numbers 9, 12 that the Messiah would also establish the same thing. And we read it in John 19, 31 to 36. He was the Passover sacrifice once for all time so that you and I could be forgiven of our sins. Now, this is interesting. If you say you are, will you be betrayed by one of your brethren, one of your disciples, for 30 pieces of silver? About $52 today's money. Will you be betrayed by one of your own? Well, Zechariah 1 and 2, 1 and 12 tells us that this was going to happen. Psalms 55, 12 to 14 tells us that one of his own would betray him for 30 pieces of silver. This is specific, isn't it? And we read in Matthew 26 and Matthew 27 how this money was given to Judas to betray the Lord. And when he realized what he had done, he came back and he threw it at their feet because it was blood money. They wouldn't accept it. Instead, they, someone took the money and again, prophetically, you'll read it in both of those, Zechariah and Psalms, the money was used to establish a piece of land where people who had no money could be buried, a potter's field. Isn't that interesting? In fact, it was called Akadema, the field of blood. I know 
you had some trials. Caiaphas, the high priest, Anus, his father-in-law, the high priest, Emeritus, Herod, the king, and Pilate twice. You were interrogated by all of these men. Hmm? Were you accused before them by false witnesses who would make up all kinds of stories? In Psalms 27 and 12 and Psalms 35 and 11, we read this prophetically, that he would be accused falsely. And it's amazing if you read the New Testament that all these false witnesses started arguing with each other. Messed up their testimony. Reasonable doubt, right? Again, Psalm 27, 12 and Psalm 35, 11, you would be accused. Were you hung upon a tree on a cross to die? Deuteronomy 21, 23 prophetically said that the Savior would be put on a tree and die. And we know the story in Matthew 27 and all the Gospels of what happened. During these interrogations by the so-called religious leaders and government officials, were you stricken? Were you hit? Were you spat upon? Did they pull out your hair? Did they do all kinds of abusive things to you? Again, the book of Micah, the prophet Micah, prophesies in Micah 5 and 1 and Isaiah 50 and 6 that this would happen. And it happened to him in every place where they took him. Is that true? It is. Okay. Were your hands and feet pierced? You say, yes, but let me see. Yes, I see. I see they were pierced. Psalm 22 and 16 and Zechariah 12 and 10. Two prophets speak about his hands and his feet being pierced. And we know the story of why it was done. While you were on the cross, as you say you are, Christ, did you notice what the soldiers did with your clothing? Yes, you're right. They gambled for your clothing and your possessions. In Psalms 22 and 18, again, King David prophesies that this would happen to the Messiah. On the cross, were you given often gall and vinegar to drink as a, a beneficent deed to help you. You were. But we know that you, did, you turned it down. But Psalm 69, 20, and, and 22 says that would happen on the cross. Do you notice how specific all of these prophecies are? Very specific. Were you despised and rejected by the people at the cross? Yes. Isaiah 53, 2 and 3. And we see the, the scene at the cross in Luke where the people despised you and mocked you and made fun of you. Come down from the cross and save me, the one thief said, right? During your trials, your four interviews, and your, your crucifixion, were you silent against your accusers? Isaiah 53, 7. He went as a sheep to the slaughter. Openeth not his mouth. He did not try to defend himself. Now here's a very important question. Some people say the Jews killed you. Some people say the Romans killed you. Who killed you? Oh. The prophet, again, King David in 31.5 Psalms, tells us that you decided to die. Into my hands I commend my, into your hands I commend my spirit. Jesus decided to die. He gave up the ghost. It wasn't taken from him. He decided. After you passed away, 
a couple of men came. One was a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Where, were they, where did they bury him? In a new tomb, a rich man's tomb, right? Isaiah 59, 53, 9, that he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. Coincidence? What do you think? And while you were being crucified, weren't you crucified with criminals as well? Oh, yes. One wanted you to come off the cross and save him so he could be, go back to be a criminal, right? And the other one said, remember me when you go into your father's house. And the Lord said, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Is that correct? I had a discussion with someone many years ago about that. They said, oh, you have to be baptized to go to heaven. I said, what about the guy on the cross? <laughs> he didn't have time to get baptized. They said, oh, it must have rained. <laughs> but you see how specific these prophecies are. The Bible even says that during the beatings that you took, your face became unrecognizable. Again, the prophet Isaiah in, in Isaiah 52, 14 describes an unrecognizable Savior Messiah who was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Did you bear our griefs and sorrows while you were on the cross? Isaiah 53, 4, Isaiah 52, 14, wounded for our transgressions. Led as a lamb to the slaughter, Isaiah 53, 7, sinless and without guile, without deception, Isaiah 53, 9. Did you make intercession for sinners? Isaiah 53, 12. He would be the intercessor so that sinners can be forgiven. Their sins washed away. Hmm? Were you the offering, the sacrifice for our sins? Were you? Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. You are the sacrifice for our sins. What does the jury say? Who is this man? Is he not the Christ? Is he not the one that was promised from the very beginning of creation? He is the Christ. We adore you for what you have done. We praise you, our Redeemer, our Savior, that all that you went through, the mockery and the beatings and the pain, you went through that for us so that we could be saved. We could be forgiven. We could be healed. But I have to ask you one last question. There is one prophecy that has not been fulfilled. When is it going to happen? Did you not say I would come again and receive you unto myself? Oh, you, you can't tell me. Okay, that's our hope. One prophecy left, but all the prophecies leading to the Savior fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. And yet people who are religious cannot figure it out. Does that make sense? Let's stand this morning. You may be visiting this morning. Maybe you were walking by and something drove you in here. But the answer is simple. Without Christ, life has no meaning. And without Christ, eternity has no meaning. No matter what you're doing, what you've done, what mess you're in, that Christ, that Messiah, that Jesus loves you. It doesn't make sense to us. Why should someone love us when we do everything against him? 
He does. That's the amazing thing about God. He loves us in spite of ourselves. If you're here this morning and you're going through all kinds of things and you have no way out, you're trapped. You've tried everything. It doesn't work. Try Jesus. It always works. He always works. You can walk out of here a different man or woman, young or old. He's done everything possible for you and I to be forgiven, to have hope, and have eternal life in his presence. 